Phantom GG here, and today we are going to talk about the world's catch 9.19, and specifically the pro play meta that's coming up for the world tournament of League of Legends. This is a tier list that doesn't create champions based off of lanes or not even just the effectiveness, but more so how they will be picked during the draft phase. This is like a pick and ban priority tier list, meaning how soon are people going to pick these champions? How important these champions will be? How high do pros really like them? These champions will be graded upon their win rates in pro play, their presence in pro play, their KDAs in pro play, and after that, we're going to give some of our own thoughts and opinions. I'm going to explain why these champions are high priority. I'm going to explain why they are low priority. And hopefully those will this will be fun for people who just like theory crafting about the world tournament. And maybe this will also teach some people about how pro play meta works out. So first off, we're going to start with the champions that are super common in pro play. So first off, we have Morgana. Morgana is going to place around the A range because... What stops you from placing her higher is she did have some nerf sword toward her black shield a while back. And so because of that, she doesn't dominate as much matchups as she used to. And her lane phase presence can be either really good or very mediocre compared to other things like Karma. And what makes her really unique and special is the fact she's the only champion in the game that can give her teammates a spell shield, which can help stop a lot of good meta champions right now. Fresh, Nautilus, to a certain degree, Alistair. These champions have a rough time against Morgana, so a correctly uh, timed pick Morgana can do a lot to stop an enemy team's team comp. So for that reason, she's not a bad champion, but she's not a great champion either. She's right in the middle, which, so we're going to place her into the A tier. Next up, we're going to have our first S tier champion. And I'm going to place Elise in all honesty, around the S range. I am debating about placing her in the S plus range, but if you look at the pro play meta and the reason why I placed her so highly is that she was picked or banned 47% of the time, picked 25 times during the finals of most of the competitions that are worldwide, and she had a 72% win rate. That means if you were to pick up a quarter, flip it four times, three of those times at least won the competition. That is an insanely high win rate, and what makes her so good right now is she's probably the queen of the early game. I don't think there's a single jungler out right now that can match her early game, except for maybe Olaf. She does AP damage, so that allows you to have an AD mid laner or a top laner. She has OKCC that helps create picks with her, with her webbing shot. She has great assassination with her missing health damage on Q, and her mobility is really nice with her spider form E jump. So, really good champion, great at setting up tower dives, great for accelerating the lead in the early game. I expect her to continue to have a high win rate and play rate, and if Riot doesn't touch her at all before Worlds, she will definitely be one to go to picks for jungle. Next up, we have another champion that's going to be priced pretty high, and that's going to be Kennen. So, going into Kennen's statistics, you'll see that he had around a 23% presence in the pro play, and he had a 67% win rate. With how much he was being picked, and not having that go down by a lot, because a lot of times when champions have very high pick rates, they have very mediocre win rates, and that's just natural when, they, when you have a high pick rate. But despite having a 23% uh, pick presence, he still manages to have a very high win rate. And a lot of what contributes to this is the fact that not many champions have a hard shutdown matchup in the cannon, and if he goes full AP, his team fighting presence with his ultimate is huge. He can get multi-man stuns, and he can just shred apart and even one-shot ADCs while providing stun after stun after stun for his teams. He's a lot like a more damage-focused version of Malphite. And I would say the big reason why Malphite isn't played more is because why play Malphite when you can just have Kennen? So that being said, next up we have another decently picked ADC, and that's going to be Ezreal. So... The reason why I'm not placing Ezreal higher is because Ezreal very rarely, unless you're a very high mechanical Ezreal like the ADC on SKT, he's going to be kind of like, you pick Ezreal so you can break even. You pick Ezreal because you want a safe lane phase. You pick Ezreal because you want your ADC to just play safe and poke people out. Very few pro players know how to push Ezreal to the fullest, and when they do, Ezreal is actually in the A range. But since most pro players are just like, 
picking up for break even circumstances, I'm going to place around the B range because very rarely in pro play are you going to see an Ezra pop the hell off and just completely carry his team. That is very rare and almost no ADC uh, CE pro players except for a certain few like the one on SKT have the ability to take home to the limits. That being said, if we are talking about SKT, I would push Ezreal up here. So that being said, I think we should grade these champions about like how good they are to the fullest. So we are going to keep Ezreal at the A range, but just notice that not many pro player Ezreals will do a lot to impress you. He's a very break even ADC, but that being said, he's good at what he's supposed to do. Next up, we have Fresh. Um, Fresh is a really good support that's coming back into the meta, and in my opinion, he's never loved it when you look at solo queue, but a lot of supports were very hesitant into picking him, but now that Tom Kench is seeing nerfs, I feel that this is going to make a lot of people lean back towards Fresh, and what makes Fresh so nice is he's a lot like Morgana, where he's good at creating plays, and he's good at stopping plays. He has his play to knock people away from his ADC. He also has his lantern that does almost the exact same job of Tom Kench's consume and just rescues so many key members while also relocating them to more correct spots of the map. I feel if anybody in the tournament scouts out that anybody on the enemy team is playing a really good fresh in scrims or whatnot, then they should consider banning fresh. So fresh, overall really good support. What stops him from placing him higher is he doesn't really dominate lane. He's more of, I create things for my jungler to happen, and if the jungler doesn't really camp for the fresh, then fresh's effectiveness in lane kind of goes down a bit, and the fresh kind of has to look to roam to be to remain effective. Next up, we have Kaisa. I'm actually going to place Kaisa into the A plus tier. Kaisa is to Bailey one of the best ADCs in the game right now who has very few rivals. If you look at the actual statistics for pro play, almost no ADC has an actual good win rate. Ash is at 0%. Caitlyn is doing okay, but it's not picked enough. Um, Jinx actually had some picks but, and did really good. But Vayne Hell only has 50%. Tristan only has 50%. Draven has 20. Varus has 35. Lucian only has a 41%. So the fact that Kaisa is one of the few ADCs that can be picked this much with 60% presence and break even into 50% really puts makes me say that Kaisa has really good priority right now. She's one of the few good ADCs you can rely on and just overall a good safe proper pick and she's not seen any nerfs into patch 9.19 which is even nicer. So she'll still remain the exact same pick she was. Where I will criticize pro player teams is in my opinion Kaisa... It's a lot like Yasuo, where she wants setup for her, where people like Skarner can activate her ultimate for her, and then Kaisa just has to press R to gun down and ult in. So I would like to see pro teams be smarter when they draft in Kaisa, and make sure they have a few people on her team that can help her out with her ultimate. Another nice part about Kaisa that I forgot to mention is she can honestly build whatever she wants and it makes sense. You want full AP, it makes sense. You want Zonias, it makes sense. You need a spell thief, it makes sense. Like whatever she wants, it can somehow make sense, which offers her a lot of build by diversity for when she needs it. Next up, we have Syndra. Syndra is a champion that actually isn't picked too much into pro play, but I feel she should see a lot more play because when you look at actual Soiki right now, not many champions can compete against her. She has raw damage, great CC, and she can just execute people whenever she wants. I feel she's a pick you have to consider banning if you don't have a plan against it. She also has a really good LeBlanc matchup. So, yeah, I think she will be definitely a decent pick in the world, especially from the fact that so many pro player mid laners that go into this year's worlds, for example, Faker, Caps, and Jensen, are all really good Syndra players. Okay, next up, we actually have probably the best champion of this patch, Rakan. Rakan is going to be probably the only champion I place in the S plus tier. Maybe I'll give some people some more reward later. But the big reason for this is he has a 67% presence, was picked 35 times, and he won 74% of all those games. Let's round that up a bit. That's basically 75%. And then, if that wasn't crazy enough, look at his KDA, 4.8, that's basically a 5. So Rakan was picked 75% of 35 games. 
uh, he was picked 35 times, had a 67% presence, and in the times he was picked, he had a 75% win rate with a 5 KD8. That is insane. He has very few matchups that actually shut him down. Actually, no matchup shuts him down. There's just a few things that can make his life a little bit harder, like Leona. And overall, nobody can really keep up with him. He can create plays. He's just basically Alistair on steroids. He has this W and R, which can all hit multiple people. And if he can hit at least three people on the enemy team with his W, that's instantly going to go into a charm. And if his team is close enough to him, you can say goodbye. And if that wasn't good enough, you can't even kill him. Because he can just press E once onto one teammate, get that teammate a shield, and then he can press E onto somebody else. It's, he, he's actually insane. He's one of the best champions of this patch. 100%. He, his presence, if pro players are smarter, are going to have an even bigger presence in the, in the world's patch. And I, I expect him to remain everything he is now in the coming the worlds. And if you give him his Scythe, then this champion just does so much work. So yeah, good champion. Pro players, p pick Rakan. Good, good champion, free win. Next up, we have Pike. Pike is also a really good champion coming into the upcoming Worlds Tournament. He was picked 12 times and he won 67% of those games. People started experimenting with him in patch 9.15, and they were having some pretty decent results. I would say the better Pike players are definitely Korean, as they know how to make better use of his roaming potential. And the way you play Pike is he's essentially a second jungler that creates picks for people all over the map. He's like a more aggressive version of Bard when it comes to his roams. And one of the things that makes him so effective is the fact that his ult can have a reset, and... If the enemy team all has low health, it's... It, Pike has this really weird playstyle where he goes QE, creates a play, but then he walks out. And you really don't want Pike to stay too much into the team fight. You kind of want him to hide. And the moment the entire enemy team has low health bars, it's just instant payday. Because he's going to go ult, 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 everybody dies. And then what makes it even better is he shares that gold. So now if a team fight happens and Pike gets like a triple kill for a quadra kill of his ultimate, massive payday for his team. Really good champion, and I'm almost tempted to place him even higher than that. And, in fact, it's hard, because I want to place him higher, but he does have counters. Pike doesn't come without weaknesses. His lane phase is a bit mediocre, and if he's not in a position where he gets to roam, then he's going to have a hard time. And, in my firm opinion, he's not the best at creating comebacks, so I will keep him at the A tier. Next up, we have Nautilus. So Nautilus, I feel, is a champion that had a lot of promise coming a few patches back, but then people started to realize what his weaknesses are, where he, Morgana's really good into him, and then Fresh is kind of better. And then if you see Nautilus, you can just instantly pick a very safe bot lane like Sivir or Morgana, and you have a really hard time, go, hard time creating plays for your team. At another point, you can just counter Nautilus with a champion like Lux, Syra, or Karma, who is also very common, to just poke him out, and then he just never almost wants to go in. And it's starting to feel like he's a champion that pro players should start to drop and only consider if there's no better options. And you can see right here, he had a 24% presence with 13 picks and only won 23% of those games. And he has a KDA of 1 right now. So I feel this is a champion that pro players seem to be very cautious of when choosing. Now we have Jarvan. So Jarvan is a champion that also has a really low win rate. And if you don't believe me, here is the st statistics right here. Where Jarvan only has around, where is he? Did Jarvan get completely dropped? I am going to be very surprised if Jarvan got dropped. No, he's right here. So he got picked 17 times, had a 25% presence, and only won 18% of those games with a KDA of 2.7. I think Jarvan is a very mediocre champion right now. I think he's really good at creating plays for his team, and that's probably where he shines best. But a problem he's having is that while he's okay at the early game, it's very outshined by Olaf and Elise. And there's just better champions to pick in the early game. So his early game, not as reliable. And then his clear is okay. And then where he's supposed to shine a lot is in the mid game. But a problem that happens is that a lot of his teams fall behind too early to abuse his mid-game power spikes. So I think Jarvan's an okay pick to consider once the good junglers either picked or banned away. 
but that's where he stays. He's just very mediocre. He's not great. He's not bad. Now we have another really mediocre pick right now, which would be Sivir. Sivir is a champion that's great when she's picked at the correct times, and I almost want to put her in the B tier, but the problem is, is you have to be careful in picking her now. There's a lot of champions that beat her in lane, and there's a lot of champions that have better scaling than her. I, I, I'm gonna make a bold move. Actually, no, I'm just gonna keep her in a C tier. I don't expect her play rate to be very high, and I don't expect her presence to be all, anything outstanding. I think she's great when you pick her at the correct times, but you have to have a game plan when you pick Sivir. You have to use her correctly, because with all the nerfs she's having, she's really feeling it right now. Next up, we have Nar. Nar, I think, is a champion that can be very decent if you pick him at the right times. He has a decent matchup into Kennen. He has a decent matchup into a lot of the ranged top laners. He can be a lane bully towards the more melee laners. But where Nar struggles is if he's against somebody who has a lot of kill pressure with like a stun and if he gets camped, it can be very punishing for the Nar player. And then another problem is that this is not so much a champion's fault but more of the team's fault where a lot of people aren't used to playing around Nar's passive. And so because of that, it causes a lot of errors in executing Nar. I think we will see Nar in pro play. He's good when he he's good when he gets to shine. I wouldn't consider him mediocre, but I wouldn't consider him great. I would say he's above average. Next up, we have Braum. So Braum has a okay pick rate right now. He has like a 50% win rate in pro play. He is good when you pair him with things like Sejuani. He's good when you give him an auto attacker that can really speed up his passive. One moment. But a big weakness that he has is there's a lot of really good champions out right now that he just really struggles against. He struggles against Morgana, he struggles against Rakan, he struggles against Fresh, and he even struggles to a certain point against Tom Kench. So because of that, he's very mediocre, and the real reason why pro players like him so much is he's just very, very good at disengaging fights with his ultimate. But even then, it's just... If you pick Braum, it's not necessarily a victory. You're picking him because you have a plan and you're hoping it's going to work. Next up, we have Jax. So we saw Fnatic pick Jax, Blipo, to high effectiveness. He picked him two times and he won both of those games. One of those games he kind of carried and in the second game, it was just very, like, how do I say... He won, but I wouldn't really give it credit to the Jax. I would give it more so credit to his team playing good. I would say Jax... If you look at every time pro players are picking Jax, it's always in second rotation and only after they find out what type of team they're facing. So I think Jax can be very good only if you know what you're facing. So that being said, I don't see Jax having super high presence into pro play. I'll say he fits with everybody else in C tier where you have to know what you're doing before you pick it. Where you have to know what type of team you're facing before you pick it. Next up, we have Rek'Sai. I'll say where Rek'Sai really shines in is that she's really good at scouting out the enemy jungle. She's really good at getting her team information. But like with Jarvan, where she is struggling is that there's a lot of champions who are a lot better than her at the early game. And she has a really rough matchup with the champions like Olaf who don't care about her at all. So I think really good Rek'Sai players can show how scary this champion can be. But I would credit that more so to the rec side players than the actual champion itself. And now we have Jace. So Jace is a top laner whose whole job is basically to auto win top lane and just snowball off his lead and then transition into a mid game seizure with his Q E poke. But I would say since his nerfs, he is no longer able to, how do I say? transition into that really oppressive poker that he used to be and then at the same time he's really hard to form a team comp with where he doesn't really how do i say match a lot of team themes outside of poke so i think he's okay i think he can definitely hard punish top laners who don't know how to play against him i think when you're a really good chase player he's probably the most oppressive bully in this game but right now we're going into the meta where it's all about like the entire team working together and not a lot of things work with Jace. So he's a top pointer where you like he fits kind of like Jax's theme where you need to know what you're facing before you pick him. 
and you need to know what you're getting into with your own team comp. Next up, we have Azir. Azir, I'm actually going to demote to the B range. Azir used to be a debate around up here for pro play a couple patches ago, and what's really hurting him is not so much the met, it's not really so much his own stats, but more so the meta and how it's changing, where there's a lot of champions that are really good at facing Azir, and now because of that, you can't blindly pick Azir like the way you used to, because if you face him against something like LeBlanc or even a Kali, it's going to be a rough time for the Azir. He also has a rough matchup into Silas and Irelia, so got to be very careful when you're picking Azir right now. You have to know what you're getting into before you pick him, just like the other champions that are in the CMB range. That being said, if you do get to late game, this champion will absolutely 1v9, but getting to late game is the secret. Next up, we're going to have a lower tier champion that I think should be dropped from pro play. And before I get into that, let me have a quick water break. So, Corky. I think Corky, since his nerfs are really bad right now, I think there's also a lot of champions that are really good into Corky. Like LeBlanc, Cassiopeia, um, most of the A tier mid laners will actually hard dominate over Corky. And I would say the only reason you even pick Corky is because you probably want like the safest lane phase possible, but even then there's safer lane phases. But I think there will be a few pro players that are still locked into the Corky meta, and they don't know how to play much of anything else. So I think we could still possibly see some Corky during pro play for Worlds Patch 9.19. Do I agree with it? No, but I think it will happen. Next up we have Vayne, and Vayne I'm going to put into the C tier. Not because Vayne is bad, but Vayne has a very rough lane phase, and before you pick Vayne, you absolutely need to know what you're facing before you do it. Because if you pick her against like a long range lane blade like Caitlyn, then you're making Vayne's life very, very hard. I also think she doesn't have the greatest matchup into Zaya either. So yeah, Vayne is good, but pick with caution. Now we have Leona. Leona is an interesting story where I don't think she's the greatest support in the world, but where she's really cool is that she can do decent into Fresh and Rakan, and she has a really nice long range ultimate that can help create picks for her team, where it's essentially like a Malphite ultimate that doesn't force you to suicide yourself. So I think Leona has her pros and cons in the pro play, and I really like seeing Leona when she's picked correctly. She's really good with these death ball type team comps, and she's really good at setting up plays for her jungler. So whenever I see a Leona on a team, I expect that bot lane to be camp floor. So Leona, decent at setting up ganks, okay roams, good team fighting, but she struggles into the fact that there's a lot of things that can bully her in lane. Next up, we're going to get into one of the other S tier champions. And that will be Olaf. And Olaf, when you go into jungle, has very high presence, very good win rate. 63% of the games he was picked in, he won. Has a good KD at 5.5. What really makes him nice is he has a good early game. And a lot of people underestimate his late and mid game, where a lot of teams love, especially on the pro play level, love to pick CC upon CC upon CC. Where sometimes even all five members on the enemy team will have some type of stun. And Olaf just doesn't care. He has good damage. It never feels bad. And he can just press ult and run at your ADC. And he'll be fairly tanky while doing it. And there's nothing you can do to take him off the ADC. Your only option is to either run away or kill him. And for that reason, I think Olaf is going to continue to be a good pick. He's seen no nerfs. And... There's really no reason to argue that Olaf is not a good champion. And some of the more popular picks like Sejuani and Jarvan, he can completely crush. So I really like Olaf coming into patch 9.19 and definitely should be pick or ban upon the early selections. Next up, we have Yasuo. Yasuo, I feel, is actually a very, very good champion. And the main problem that Yasuo has in pro play is there's not a lot of players that can execute him to the highest of levels. But you'll see in the 10 games he was picked, he won 70% of all those games, had a KD of 4.6, and won most of the games by 31 minutes. So he won it at a very good time frame, and he won most of his games. So I think Yasuo is very good, just not a lot of people can execute him. Uh, but when he can be executed, 
he's actually really good in pro play because there's a lot of ideas you can do with him where anybody with knockup and with the really good meta junglers like Gragas, he teams up with so well. He also teams up with Sejuani very well, so he's easy to work with. He has really good matchups and he has really good team fights. A really good pick that I hope that a lot of more that more mid laners in the pro level practice for coming into worlds. All right, Alistair. So Alistair has a fun little story that I like to talk about. Where I'm gonna play some around the B or A range. Hard to grade them uh, fully, but what I like about Alistair is supports really like playing tanks because supports really like creating plays for their team. They really like peeling. They like being spongy. They like being part of the action. The first really good tanky support was Braum, but then he kind of fell out of the meta due to changes in what people were playing. Then the next really good support was Galio for the tanky end, but then Galio lost his splash, and then he lost play. But what people like doing both with Braum and Galio on the pro level is they liked abusing their level 3 power spike and calling their jungler to come bot lane. They would hyper push the lane to be under ta enemy tower, and then they would just set up almost a very free and easy to execute tower dive that would most likely kill the enemy ADC, and then pro play players would get an early game lead off of doing stuff like that. But as Braum and Galio became less reliable at doing it, people learned that you can actually do plays like that with Alistair. But where Alistair kind of struggles is he's not as tanky at doing it compared to the others. And he doesn't have his full 6 ultimate yet. So Alistair is really good at creating plays. He's a champion to be creative with, with how reliable his WQ combo is. He is almost unkillable the moment he's level 6. His team fight presence is decent with the adding of his new E. I really like this champion, but where I fail to place him higher on this list is the fact there's a lot of matchups that are really good into him. Alright, next up is Gameplank. So Gameplank is probably one of the better top winners of this patch. He's very hard to execute, but even then, his presence was around 42%, and in the 21 games he was picked, he won 62% of all those games, so that's actually pretty nutty. His late game is actually excellent and probably unrivaled, except to maybe Jax. And if you just want to talk about late game damage, this guy will bring the hurt late game. And not to mention, his ult is really good at doing the task that Kenan wants to do, where he says, if you go this way, you get hit by my ultimate. If you go that way, you get hit by my team. Good luck. Next up, we have Kled, and where I personally really like Kled that makes me put him into the A-listing is that Kled almost auto-wins every single matchup into top lane right now. He has a really high teamfight presence ultimate. He's really good at what we call death ball comps, where almost everybody on the enemy team is dedicated towards running at you and killing you. And because of his ultimate, he can help those death ball comps get in and just fight really quickly and end the fight quickly. And then, not only is his ultimate basically Severus ultimate, but at the end of it, he does a small little stun towards the person he hits. Just overall, a really good champion, with very few matchups he struggles against. Next up, we have LeBlanc. I'm also going to put LeBlanc into the A tier range. And where I like LeBlanc is she's probably, since the nerfs of Akali, the best mid lane assassin in the game right now if you want AP damage. She's a really good roamer. She's really good for camping for. She has kill presence across the board. And where the only part she struggles in is that her late game is kind of mediocre, but her mid game is very ferocious and something you have to watch out for. And going into this tournament, we have one of the best LeBlanc players in the world, Faker. And when you look at Faker's LeBlanc, it was almost permabanned in the LCK against him. And. There's a few other pro players going into this tournament, for example, Caps, who are also very talented at LeBlanc. So I think LeBlanc is going to be a very contested pick, and I would actually buff her right now to the A plus range, just because of who's actually going to this year's Worlds. That being said, let's talk about Volleybear. So Volleybear was almost an LCK exclusive pick, but I feel because Korea is starting to shine again, we might see a bit of the Korean meta seeping into this competition. Volleybear was really good at stopping mobile comps, and he was really good at doing the job of Leona. I would say Volleybear was a lot like the LCK's version of Leona, 
where you picked him because you really wanted something to answer the mobility that we saw in field play. Sorry about all the water breaks. I think Volibear, Volibear's biggest problem is that he's very easily to bully, and there's a lot of things you can do to counter him, but if you pick Volibear at the correct times, having the correct information you need, he's a very oppressive support where you can't dodge his flip. His flip is guaranteed to hit you, and then if you're, if Volibear's jungler is near him, it's going to be a guaranteed kill every time. Then his teamfight ultimate is very nice where... It doesn't do any CC, but if people clump together, it's going to be layers and layers of damage. So I do think we might see some Volibear into pro play. And if we do, it would be very exciting, very focused on kills. Next up, we have Skarner. So Skarner is more of a Western pick, where teams like Liquid really like to pair it with the Kai'Sa. I think teams like Liquid show how good this champion can really be if you play him correctly. His early game isn't the worst either, where he can just do auto into stun, which can... So he does have some options in the early game. His mid game is very crazy. And I would say where Skarner shines best is... He's one of the most effective junglers at ending games, where if his team gets a lead, basically every time he presses his ultimate, it's going to be a guaranteed kill. So I feel against teams like Liquid... If Liquid continues to be a very good Skarner abusing team in the world, you might actually need to consider banning it specifically against Liquid. And I think if other teams can play Skarner to the same effectiveness as Team Liquid, then he will actually be a pick that we'll see a lot. I do feel he has a rough matchup into Olaf and Elise, but those champions are most likely to be permabanned anyways. So we'll see a lot, a lot of Skarner if these champions continue to be picked or banned. Well, not really pick, but more so banned, because Skarner becomes like the next best option. Next up, we have Vladimir. So I'm actually going to place Vladimir at a place that might surprise people in the C tier. And a big reason why I place Vladimir so low is when you think about everything that's high, Gameplank, Jace, Kled, all these champions can go into Grievous Wounds, and then they can really hard bully Vladimir into the top lane. You can even pick top lane Yasuo and build a Grievous Moon Sword, and then the Vladimir is going to struggle. Vladimir can do amazing work into the late game, but his early game is so weak that if you don't pick him correctly, you're going to put him into a bad matchup where he just hard feeds and becomes almost useless and never gets to go to late game. Next up, we have Rumble. So, Rumble... I don't know how much he's going to actually be picked because a lot of the good Rumble players didn't exactly make it to Worlds. But I do think Rumble is actually a really decent top laner that saw some play in the pro play to a certain effectiveness. And what's really nice about Rumble is his ultimate basically creates a zone that the entire enemy team is not allowed to walk towards. So he kind of resembles Gameplank and Kennen in that aspect. And at the same point, if you put him against a melee top laner like Jax or... I don't know, Yasuo, he can really stomp that matchup because they have no way to avoid his flame spitter. He basically says, run away from me or you're going to take a lot of damage. And then his team, fa uh, team phase is actually pretty good too because flame spitter can just hit multiple people over and over again. Next we have Varus. Varus is actually a champion I think should be dropped when it comes to pro play. I think the only time you pick Varus is when you have absolutely no other options. That he's just the only good pick left. He has a 30% win rate in the pro play right now. And I think a lot of that just has to do with the fact that a while ago Rageblade got nerfed and Varus got nerfed. And that really hurt his effectiveness in pro play. And people are mostly only picking him for his farming safety. Now we have a Fnatic pick where we're talking about Broxa's Nocturne that he won two games with. And I think he played it in three games as well. I think Broxel played a really good Nocturne, and I think with what he showed us, Nocturne can be very effective when picked correctly. With that being said, I don't expect Nocturne to be picked up by everybody, and I do think Nocturne has some very clear weaknesses with his early game that just weren't abused hard enough in the matches he was picked. I would still prefer Elise and Olaf over Nocturne if I was a team going in. I think when you pick Nocturne, it's because you had a strategy and you worked hard on practicing that strategy. 
now we have an A plus pick. I feel Renekton has almost no bad matchups, and kind of what makes them a bit different from the Clud is actually I was gonna reverse reverse helmet with Clud. I'm gonna place Clud at A plus and Renekton at A. Sorry about that. So where I like Renekton is that Renekton can become tankier than Clud, and then his stun is also super reliable. But where Renekton also struggles is the fact he doesn't have how do I say? He doesn't have scaling on his side. When you have Renekton, you have to win by the mid game. And if you don't win by the mid game, you will get outscaled and outvalued by picks like Kled, Rumble, or even Kennen. So Renekton is just a champion that you have to pick if you know how to win early. He doesn't have many bad matchups, but once again, you need to know how to win early to use this champion effectively. But if the enemy team stalls and they know how to stall, then Renekton kind of gets a little bit hurt, but I would still say he's a very good champion coming to this patch. So, I'm actually going to move Kaelin to the sweeper section. We'll talk about Kaelin later. So, next up we have Ash. Ash is actually getting a, a small buff going into the next patch, where Q now auto-attack resets. With that being said, I'm going to put Ash around the C range because... Almost everybody who's a mid laner can just ruin her life, like... Syndra just has to press R and not land any abilities, and the Ash just dies instantly. So, I think Ash is really cool where she can create plays of her ultimate, but she struggles in the fact that if the enemy team has like high nuke champions, the Ash can almost never play forward, and that kind of goes against Ash's being because Ash wants to empower her Q and just gun down people, but with picks like Syndra, Ash doesn't really get to do that. Next up, we have Irelia, and I'm actually going to place Irelia around A tier. I almost want to pick her a little bit higher. I I'm just going to keep her at the A tier, because where Irelia struggles is that Renekton and Clud are both very effective into her. But if her picks, like, how do I say it? If you ban her counters, or if her counters just weren't picked that game, then Irelia can be very effective. Like, Irelia is a very hard conversation to have, because in some stereo normals, she can be, like, up here. But in, in common scenarios, you don't really see people abuse her correctly. Her top lane win rate was actually 75%. She was picked only 4 games though, so she was banned a lot, but she won 3 of her 4 games. She, she's a very hard champion to decide how good she actually is, because she received a lot of bans. So I feel when it comes to Irelia, we don't have a lot of information on how good she actually is on a pro level. So I'm just going to play it safe and say she's on the A tier level. And I feel the biggest reason why Irelia receives a lot of bans is because the people who know how to play Irelia are really, really good at Irelia. So people are just playing the safe end and saying, we don't want to see Irelia snowball, we're just going to ban it. But I will say, if people are more willing to experiment like Clud or Renekton into her, they would see that Irelia does have weaknesses. Alright, so now we're going into our next section. The sleeper section. So these are champions that pro players don't play very often, if at all. But champions that I believe are very, very good coming into the tournament. And where I believe they should sit. So Caitlyn, she received AD buffs. And when you actually look at Caitlyn right now, she has the best lane phase in the game. There's almost nobody that actually beats her in lane phase. And if we're talking about lane phase alone, I actually don't think there is anybody that beats her. She has a very awkward team phase. And there's just not a lot of players that know how to fully execute her. But if pro players actually properly practice Caitlyn effectively, I actually think she's going to be in the A plus range. Next up, we have Camille. Not many people are playing Camille right now, but if you look at solo queue, she has a very high win rate, one of the best top winners in the game. She has a really good, and when you look at pro play, she has a really good team fighting ultimate that can help you wear CC upon CC onto single targets. So I think if pro players pick her correctly, she's going to be around the B range and something you should consider banning if you find out somebody on the enemy team knows how to play her fully effectively. Next up, we have Vel'Koz. Vel'Koz, I think, is actually a very, very good champion who beats almost all the mages in the mid lane. But where he struggles is he's a very easy champion to camp, but his scalings are very good. And I think people should really consider picking Vel'Koz if they're against something like Syndra or even LeBlanc. Actually, a block would probably do well into Vel'Koz, but Vel'Koz does do good into most of the mages right now. Next up, we have Talia. Talia is both a really good jungler and a really good mid laner. I would actually place her into the A range because of her flexibility. Because if the enemy team picks uh, Talia, you can't really tell where she's going to go. And she just has 
really good matchups into almost anything. I think she has some weaknesses where you can camp her in the early game and she's mid lane, but at the same time, when teams are picking Talia, you don't know where she's going to go. Next up, we have Echo. So LS has been very vocal about how good he believes Echo is. He's He talks about the uh, quote, quote, Chinese uh, mid laner who plays nothing but Echo when he's merged into the Korea Challenger solo queue. And I would say LS is right on the money when he says that Echo is probably one of the best mid laners in the game when you play into full effectiveness. I would actually put him around the S range. And big reason I'll play with him in the S range is because very, very good mid laner that not many people can stop. And at the same time, people are experimenting with Echo Jungle now. So now that you, if you have teams that are probably practicing Echo, they can flex them between both jungle and mid lane. So now you don't even know where the Echo is going. So I would say Echo would be a very prized pick if teams can practice them and learn them in time. That being said, I don't really expect it to happen. Next up, we have what I like to call the con picks. So Con tried Rise into one game of SKT, and it was actually amazing. He was definitely the star of that game. I would say that Rice is around the B range. I would say he has some matchups you need to be careful about, but a late game Rise is still a late game Rise. I would say Khan really showed what Rise can do right now. I would also say Khan's Quinn is very effective, where she almost performs what Jace wants to do while being more so focused onto the assassination. So I'm messaging. I'm talking about both these two picks, Starship, because of LCK. But when you see what they can do, they have high KDAs, they perform really hard, and they can snowball very hard. While also having very few bad matchups. Next up, we have Kasten. Faker tried out Kasten recently. I would say Kasten's actually around the C range, and the reason why I would place Kasten at the C range is because he has not many good matchups, but at the same time, Kasten is probably the king of the mid game if we're talking of the late game and we're talking about mid laners. Almost no mid laner has a better late game than Cassidy. He is hyper mobile, hard to kill, becomes tanky, does lots of damage, just a very strong mid laner to the point I would actually put him into the B range because if you pick him at the right time, he is very hard to stop. Next up we have Kindred. This is mostly based off of Korean solo queue where she has a really good pick rate and win rate and at the same time, she is pro play viable. We saw her in some games in the past with certain effectiveness. She's really good against high burst comps, but at the same time, she's very easy to shut down the early game where you can just invade her and take away her marks. So I place her on the C range, but if pro players pick her up, I do think she can actually do some work. Next up, we have Jinx. Jinx is actually starting to see a resurgence in the pro play where she had a very high pick rate when she was played. She, if you look into the stats right now, she had a 7% pick rate, but in the seven game, in all six games that she was picked in, she had an 83% win rate. So we can actually count that out right now if you want the actual number. So she was picked 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 times, and she only lost one of those games. And in the game she lost, she still had a good KDA. So I think Jinx is definitely one of the better ADCs going into the competition, and I would love to see more pro players pick her up. Next up, we have Tristana. So there was a lot of talks about mid lane Tristana, and I would say Tristana is really good as a flex pick. She's decent as an ADC. She's really good as a mid laner. She doesn't lose to almost nobody. And if your team knows how to play around this properly, I actually don't see many ways to stop mid lane Tristana. She's really good at killing towers. She scales amazingly well. The only problem with mid lane Tristana is if you pick it, you have to draft in a certain way that's dedicated towards protecting her. Alright, so I'm going to take a quick sip of water and we can talk about the buffs. Alright, so now, for it, now we're going to talk about the buff champions. So what makes patch 9.19 so interesting is we didn't get to see 9.17, we didn't get to see 9.18. So that means we're going two whole patches, free if you include 9.19, without seeing anything of what pro play has been like to these changes. Pro players stayed on 9.16 and we did not know how they would adjust to 9.17 or 9.18. We missed those two patches. That's two whole patches of no information. So 
what 9.19 is going to be like, it's going to be huge. We're going to notice a lot of different things being picked, which is the large reason why I'm doing this tier list to help people out. So, if we're talking about champions that were buffed from 9.17 to 9.19, Lee Sin has seen quite a buff. We're seeing a buff to his R. We've seen in Soku his win rate skyrockets instead of pickings. If you go to League of Legends, LOL Lytics, you go to Korea, make it Master Plus, make it about jungle, boom, Lee Sin. Probably one of the best junglers in the game for Soku right now for high elo. 55% win rate, 30% pick rate. This champion is actually a monster right now. His rivals would be Elise. His rivals would be Talia, Olaf, Nidalee. But this champion is actually a monster. So I don't know if we'll see it from the Western teams. But if the Korean teams bring in their best Elise and players... This champion is almost on the A plus S range, and I think he's gonna be. If you're facing Western teams, unless that Western team has Ben Skarin, you won't see him banned a lot. But if you're facing the LCK team, and the LCK team has a goodly Sin player, you have to ban it and get rid of it. Next up, we have Misfortune. Misfortune saw buffs towards her slow, which kind of opens up options to play Misfortune support. And at the same time, Misfortune ADC is not the worst thing either. Ellis mentioned how he saw Miss Fortune play to certain effectiveness in scrims, but then she was just dropped completely. We have almost no information about Miss Fortune, but I would say if pro players can actually practice Miss Fortune effectively, I would actually place her around the B range, both as an ADC and as a support. Next up, we have Graves. So I actually don't think the Graves buffs matter too much. I would say maybe there might be a few good Graves players going into the competition. I doubt he'll be picked. And I, I'm gonna, I don't, I don't even know how, how much he's gonna be picked. I'm gonna put him in the maybe section, which is what this is for. Maybe section means I really doubt it's gonna be picked. I don't think it's gonna have a lot of influence. If I was to grade him, I would put him around the CB range, but I really don't think he's worth a conversation. I don't think we'll see much graves in the competition, but we'll maybe see him. Uh, let's actually put this higher now. Do, do, do. Oh my god, I, 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 I'm boosted. Alright, there we go. So, gray is going to be the maybe we'll see it section. But I doubt it, so don't think about it too much. Next up, we have Orianna. Orianna's getting a nice little buff onto her R. Where Orianna kind of struggles is... There's a lot of champions that are kind of good into her in the matchups right now. Like, Syndra is really good into Orianna. Irelia can be really good into Orianna. Talia can be really good into Orianna. But that being said... A really good Oriana comp can be very scary to face. If you can give her a proper delivery system, jungler, like, there's many things that Oriana can do, but you have to definitely pick it correctly. Um, Pantheon. So Pantheon got a lot of buffs, and, and when he was released, where they fixed his Q to do more damage upon the tap. I think Pantheon is a very interesting champion, where he has some really good matchups, but... I do think he has counters like Ribbon, who are really effective into him. I think Renekton is really good into him. But if you pick Pantheon correctly, I think he's flexible between he can be picked both support and top, even mid. He could also be picked into the jungle, so he's very flexible. Like, you don't know where he's going if you pick him. But at the same time, he's not the most, how do I say, disgustingly OP champion. I'd say he's good above average. Xin Zhao is actually going to get some buffs towards his Q. I think Xin Zhao is really good in the sense he's very reliable, but it's kind of hard to decide if he's C or B range. I think he's more reliable than Jarvan and, Re and Rek'Sai when it comes to early game, but at the same time, he doesn't do a, whole, a lot much. Like, you pick Xin Zhao because you want a really, really reliable early game that's almost impossible to mess up. You want to snowball the game, but he's not like the most impressive thing ever. I think there might be some teams that practice Xin Zhao's early game because they want like really reliable early game, and maybe against those teams they'll ban it, but I don't see them having the highest priority coming into pro play. So next up, we have Riven Bust. The Riven Bust are huge, 100% W going to 130. They're also doing some compensation bust to her R to give it a little bit more oomph since they're rolling the execution from 200% to 100%. But that being said, I think these are very nice buffs, and I think 
if we get any good ribbon players coming into this competition, she definitely looks like she'll be around A range. Maybe even A+, plus, but I think that would be almost too bold to say. I think she will be a very good comp champion coming into this competition. Next up, we have Cassiopeia. She's getting her empower her Twin Fang buffed. I think she's actually a very good champion. I think pro players very much underutilize her. I think she should definitely be played more, but that's going to be up to the pro players to actually practice her. Next up, Evelyn got some buffs towards her R to have higher execution. But she's very hard to play with. She takes a lot of practice to play with. And I actually very much doubt that pro players have enough time to play her effectively. I think if pro players were good at her, she'd be around here. Maybe even here. But, like I said, it's going to all depend. Do pro players have enough time to practice her? And I don't think so. Next up, we have Zoe. Zoe's getting some buffs on her passive. If we're talking about Zoe cube, Zoe's already a decent champion already. I think there's a lot of good Korean players when it comes to playing Zoe. I think Zoe, if you know how to play her properly, is definitely an A-tier champion. She has a lot of comps that she's good with, and you can actually make some really creative poke comps with her too. Next up, we have Twisted Fate. Twisted Fate is getting some e-buffs. Twisted Fate can do some really cool cross-map strategies with this ultimate. We see both AD and AP Twisted Fate being played right now in Soul Q to a certain effectiveness. That being said, I would actually play some around the B range. If you're banning Twisted Fate as a pro player, it's because you know the enemy team has a really good Twisted Fate and you're not used to facing it and you just don't want to see it. Next up is a very interesting conversation. So, if you guys remember last year's Worlds, ADC Heimerdinger was permabanned against Sven. And a few other players. Heimerdinger was seen as a almost unbeatable ADC bot laner that was allowed to do a lot of very annoying things that people did not want to see at all. That being said, he takes a lot of practice, he takes a lot of getting used to. I think if we were to talk about pro play, he'd probably be around the B range, A range once again, but. That's going to require a lot of practice on pro players to get used to, and I'm going to put them into the maybe section. We'll maybe see Heimerdinger. Mordecai just gained some sustain buffs onto his uh, W to help him have more healing. I think he has a lot of good matchups. I think he's pretty tough to play against, and I actually put him around the B range. Really good lane bully. His ultimate basically removes people from the team fights, and kind of like Skarner, he forces the enemy team to build QSS, which they don't want to do, so that's actually very handy. I'd actually put Mordecai around the B range right now. Um, next up is Galio. Galio has seen a lot of buffs towards his damage and base stats. That being said, I don't think we're ever going to see him in pro play until they give him back his flash. If we ever see this champion again, it's... I, I don't know. I don't know what's going to take to bring him back into pro play, but I don't think these buffs are enough. But maybe we'll see him. If we do see him, it's probably going to be as a mid laner. Maybe even a top laner. But I don't expect it to happen. Next up, Clissa got some damage buffs on, I believe it was her auto attacks. And I, I think they were okay buffs. I think SKT is a team that really knows how to abuse champions like Clissa. I think LCK is a really good region around when it comes to abusing Clissa. I place her around the B range if you play her effectively. And as you do expect this year at Worlds, I actually expect a few Clissa games. I actually expect a few Clissa bans against teams that know how to play her. Next up, we have Lucian. Lucian got some base AD buffs. At the same time, Cookies got nerfed, and Lucian loves that. I think Lucian will be somewhat contested for in pro play, but I don't expect him to be like the be-all, end-all pick. I expect him to have probably like a 20% presence with like a 50% win rate. Where Lucian struggles is that Lucian very rarely hardcore carries you. He's kind of like a more damage-focused version of Ezreal. Next up, we have Fiora. Fiora says she gained some really nice buffs to killing towers. That being said, Fiora is almost exclusively a counter pick. So, you actually need some information before you pick Fiora. But that being said, I, I think we can expect Fiora to be picked a bit. I I don't know. She's going to be around. Maybe because of, uh, if you look at, let's see. Let's actually stat check really fast. We can stat check this right now. So, top lane, Fiora. 
we actually saw almost no Fiora. Yeah, there was no Fiora doing 9.16. But I think these buffs will tempt people to pick Fiora because now she has so much more reward. I do expect her to be a red side exclusive pick though, so you know exactly what you're doing before you pick her. Next up, Jin. Do I expect to see Jin at Worlds? No. I, I think he's just way too easy to kill without enough reward. You're just better off playing J Ash. So now we're going to talk about the nerf champions. This is where it gets interesting because there's a lot of really good champions that got nerfed. So, first off, we have Karma. So, Karma before these nerfs, I would actually place her on the B A plus range. But with these nerfs, I think it removes mid lane Karma. I think it makes top lane Karma harder to pull off. And we're basically going to see Karma exclusively as a support pick now. So I actually think these AP nerfs to her Q going from 60% to 40% will actually put her down to B range. Who knows, maybe I might remove Karma completely from pillar play, but I doubt it because there's probably too many supports that are used to playing Karma. Next up, we have Tom Kench. So Tom Kench, before these nerfs, was definitely around the S range for pro play specifically. A lot of it has to do with the fact that not a lot of people are playing Tom Kench's counters, but people largely pick Tom Kench in pro play because his consume is just very, very good and his R creates very unique rotations. I think the nerf to his healing, from the fact that it has compensation buffs that allows him to have 100% healing, I, I actually only mark him down to the A plus range. I think he's still going to be a very prized support for pro play. Next up we have Yumi. So Yumi was definitely. Yumi's presence in pro play is very, very high if we're talking about bans alone. But one thing that's interesting is she has more picks than she has bans. Which means there's sometimes where she isn't banned, but she still doesn't get picked. And even while being picked, she only has a 50% win rate. So I think what's going on with Yumi right now is she is banned so much that teams actually just don't know how to play her. I think that's actually a thing. I think she is banned so much that teams don't know how to abuse her correctly. And because of that, they can only get a 50% win rate when they pick her. I believe if she wasn't banned so much, players would have a better understanding of her. Uh, I think Yumi is a champion that should have had a similar win rate towards Rakan. But just because of how unused the people are at playing Yumi, it kind of hurts the experience they have with her on the pro stage. But with these nerfs to her Q slow, I still think she's going to be a very good support, and I think it bunks her down to around the A-plus range, maybe even A range, but I'm going to place her around the A-plus range, because her ultimate's really good, her healing's really good, her W stats are really good. I think she'll still have a high ban rate, but at the same time, I really don't think pro players know how to use her effectively. I am not impressed with pro play Yumi, oddly enough, even though she's meant to be a pro play only champion. So next up we have Sejuani. So Sejuani I feel has been falling out of the meta for a while. And she only has like a 45% win rate on patch 9.16. And with these final nerfs towards her damage specifically on her passive. I think we're going to see a lot less Sejuani. I think people are know how to face at this point. But people will still pick Sejuani because of her really good team fire presence. And how easy she is to draft with. Next up we have Silas. So Silas before the nerfs was definitely around S tier. But... With his armor being gutted, there might be a good chance that Silas jungle isn't good anymore. And there, it's going to definitely hurt his matchups into AD mid laners. So I think he'll still be very good if we're talking about, how do I say, mid laners? But I don't expect him, expect him to be, remain a good jungler. I expect him to be around the A range, so we're going to demote him to around there. Now we have Aatrox. So in the eyes of most pro players... Aatrox was up here, but if you looked at his actual win rate in patch 9.16, it was bad. He had was picked 39 times, and he only won 31% in those games. Now, let's look at the opposite end. Akali was picked 7 times, she won 71% of those games. She had a 72% presence, and when she was picked, she had a good win rate. Renekton, high pick rate, good win rate. Game playing, high pick rate, good win rate. So there's a lot of champions that were picked almost as much as Aatrox, and they were able to have a good win rate. So that being said, I think pro players discovered the weaknesses towards Aatrox, but they really wanted to try their best to make them work. 
and it was just a champion they were forcing way too hard. So I think before the nerfs, he was actually around over here. But with the nerfs, from the fact he already had a 30% win rate, I think this actually guts him, and he's going to be a D tier top laner. Because his sustain is just actually gutted, his wave clear is gutted. I do not expect him to remain a very good pick coming into Worlds, but because of pro player habits, I still expect him to try to force it. Next up, we have Akali. So Akali was probably up here. Akali had almost 100% presence in the pro play. No, she did have 100% presence, and despite having 100% presence, she broke even with a 50% win rate. So, she... so imagine her being picked every single game, and then still coming out with a 50% win rate. Really monstrous champion, but with the removal of her stun, with the removal of her damage, with the removal of the cooldown, I, I, I would place her around over here. I, I think she has very unique scenarios where she can be good, but she almost might even be D tier. I think pro players should actually pick her a lot less coming into this competition, but I still think she'll probably still be spammed. Okay, so the reason I'm bringing up Nunu, even though he's not a pro play champion, is in patch 9.17 and 16, he was, I mean 9.17 and 18, he was very, very good in patch 9.17, and I think pro players might have considered her playing him in patch 9.17, but because that patch never happened, we never got to see it, but because of his nerfs, I think the chances of us seeing Nunu are just basically zero. I, I, I don't expect us to see any Nunu at all. But I'm just bringing him up into the conversation because he was actually a monster during 9.17. So there might be some people thinking like, hey Phantom, will we see Nunu? My answer, because of the nerfs, no, I don't expect to see Nunu. Now we have Saya. So Saya, before the nerfs that she had on her ultimate and her armor, she was definitely the best ADC in the game. She had the highest pick rate and the highest win rate out of anybody. But with the nerfs towards her armor, She's definitely exposed to things like Caitlyn, but her team fighting presence is still really good, and her how do I say her her E is really good, her scaling is really good. I always want to put her into the A plus range. I would actually say I I actually put her into the A plus range because I don't think she should be perma banned, unless you know that the enemy team is just really actually let's let's put her against uh, we can put her in the S range. If you know the enemy team has a really good side, you should actually just perma ban it. Uh, I know it's hard. You know what? We're going to put it A+. That's my final answer. I think the armor nerfs make her very exposed to things like Caitlyn, and you got to be careful about that. But who knows? Maybe I'm full chip. Maybe she'll be the S range. She's hard to talk about. They were big nerfs, but... Okay, people are going to make fun of me, but you know what? Final answer, not changing it. S tier. I think she's gonna be really, really freaking good coming into Worlds. Okay, so Aurelian Soul, we're not gonna see. He got nerfed really hard. That the changes were terrible. Bye bye Aurelian Soul. We're never gonna see you again in pro play. Bye. Uh Kiana. So Kiana was probably one of the best mid laners in the game. She did research the nurse towards her cooldown ultimate. I think that Kiana has some bad matchups she has to be careful of. I actually put her around the A plus range. I do think though if you're facing really good Kiana players you should just ban it. Now, finally, Gragas is receiving very small love tap nerfs. 8% damage to 7%. 5 seconds to 6 seconds on cooldown. They're not going to matter. Uh, I'm going to show you the stats right now. 9.16. Gragas was the most picked jungler by far. 61% win rate. That's insane for the amount of times he was picked. If you want to see the actual full on detailed statistics right here, here it is. Good KDAs every game. You go Predator. You, you run at people like a monster. You see him being picked against almost everything. You see him being picked against Gragas, Jarvan, Sejuani, Elise, and he just tramples through them. Very good jungler. Best jungler in game right now if we're talking about pro play. Should just be perma picked or banned. If you're not picking it, you ban it. If you're not banning it, you, you pick it. So that being said, this is the tier list of pick and ban priority coming into Worlds Patch 9.19. I hope everybody found this informative, and before we end this off, we're just going to talk about counterpicks. Lissandra, she counterpicks LeBlanc, 
she's really good into most of the assassins because they jump in, she presses W, or she R's herself, or she R's the opponents. Really good counter pick into assassins. Syra, she's really good into the tank supports, really good into Tom, really good into Leona, really good into Alistair. I hope she's picked more. She's just really good into these tanky matchups, and she should see more play. Draven, he counterpicks the late game ADCs to certain effectiveness. Lux, she counterpicks Zoe. Poppy and Vagar, they counter mobility. Kogma, she he kind of counters late game as well, from the sense that his late game is better. And if you protect him properly, he's actually kind of a monster. Mundo counters AP and CC. Trundle counters tanks. And Cillian kind of counters the assassins when the fat team can get his team revives. So... That being said, let's put this a bit higher. Screenshot it, share it, do whatever you want. Like, subscribe, I don't care. I hope you found this informative. This is the meta I expect to see coming to World League of Legends Worlds Patch 9.19. Once again, this is pro play only. This is not me saying champions are good or bad. This is me saying how much I expect pro players to really focus down onto these champions into the upcoming patch. If your champion did not make it into this list, this is not me calling your champion bad. This is just me analyzing pro player habits and what I expect to happen. Have a good day. I hope you all like this.